Hi, this is Mr. Carr. Welcome to another review. This is Elements of Fiction, all about characters. So today we're going to be talking about some of the major forms of characters in fiction, and we'll of course begin with the protagonist. Uh, this is the main character of a story. It's the person who's got a problem that needs to be solved. It's the whole reason, um, often, that a story has been written, or a song, or a movie, or... Um, it's it's the main character. Sometimes it's seen as a hero. Um, and sometimes you can share this position with multiple people, such as in um, a book by Julia Alvarez called In the Time of the Butterflies. There's four sisters who equally play main protagonists. So think to yourself, who are your favorite protagonists out there? Here's a couple of examples. We've got Wonder Woman, Harry Potter, Katniss Everdeen from The Hunger Games. These are all the main characters. So opposite of the main character, there's a character that gets in the way all the time, so to speak. This is the, quote, bad guy of the story. It's the force which opposes the protagonist or prevents the protagonist from getting what they want. Um, this we call the antagonist. So who's your favorite villain? Here are some of mine. We've got Maleficent, Darth Vader, and of course Team Rocket from Pokemon, which is a good example of how um, two people can be protagonists. So we've got a main character, and we've got the opposite of a main character, which is the main villain, so to speak, the main force in the way. Um, another thing that authors will sometimes do is they'll create what's called a foil character. Foils are a character that enhances the traits of another character by being its opposite. And this one makes more sense when you look directly at examples. So we've got Sherlock Holmes who is messy, he's eccentric, he's rude, he doesn't give people the time of day but he's also incredibly smart. And then his best friend, if you can call him that, Dr. Watson, who is a very organized man. He's rigid, he's gentlemanly. Uh, he's been known to do things like after a battle where the antagonist has been killed in the end, he'll go back to cover him up with a, a sheet, so to speak. He's always faithful. And What's great about this complex, being a foil, is that we identify with Dr. Watson. We understand the gentlemanly nature of a British gentleman of this time. And because of his character traits, we see just how unorganized Doc, uh, Sherlock Holmes is. Another one is the Potter Malfoy complex. Um, in the series Harry Potter by J.K. Rowling, um, Harry is good, and he's valorous, and he's chivalrous, and he's always trying to protect other people, and the opposite thereof is Draco Malfoy. Draco Malfoy is not the antagonist of the series. He's uh, a secondary character, but he plays a very important role. He is, quote, the best of the Slytherins. He is conniving, he's weaselly, but, but not a weaselly character, um, and because of how terrible Draco Malfoy is, what a bully he can be, Harry shines even brighter in its face. This is how a foil works. So now that we've kind of talked about the main character and the main villain, and we've understood how foils can be set up, Let's talk about how we describe characters. So first off, characters can be flat. Now, often a main character, a protagonist or an antagonist, are, they're not flat. We need them to be more fleshed out. But a flat character is two-dimensional, so to speak. We often don't know a lot about them. We might know a little bit about their backstory. Um, they might have a very few number of character traits. It doesn't mean that we don't fall in love with them. Some of our favorite characters are, are flat, actually, uh, but they're lesser, they're of lesser importance in a story. And it makes sense. If an author took time to fully flesh out every character in a novel, uh, the novel would be gigantic. 
So a couple of examples here. Uh, we have Jinji from the Shrek series. You know, we know that he was baked somewhere. We know that he is breakable and that he's, he's fallible, but the, we really don't know a lot more about him. Um, if we're talking classic Star Wars series, the canon of Star Wars, so to speak, Chewie, we love Chewie, Chewbacca, but there's we don't know a lot about him. Now, there's a wealth of fan fiction out there devoted just to Chewbacca, and you could fully flesh his character out, but we're talking kind of the canon series. And of course, Han Solo, now there's a whole movie about Han, he's becoming more round. Um, and Timon and Pumbaa from The Lion King. We know that somewhere in their past they did something and were exiled, uh, you know, but we really don't know. They're the trick. They're the jokesters. Now characters can be flat, but then characters that are more developed and the author takes more time to create, we call them round. So round characters, fully developed, they have multiple dimensions to their personalities, strengths, weaknesses, flaws, quirks, they feel real. And what's beautiful about a round character is that somewhere within them we identify. So for instance, um, this is Anne Shirley from Anne of Green Gables. This is a picture taken from a recent Netflix series, but anyone who has read the original Anne of Green Gables knows what an incredible character was created in Anne Shirley. She is an orphan. She has red hair that she despises, but also somehow likes as she grows older. She is super intelligent, uh, but she can get lost in her intelligence. She has this imagination that runs away with her to the point where she doesn't do her chores. So she's quite flawed. She has a tongue that lashes out at people, but then she also goes back and apologizes because in her heart, Anne Shirley is, is a beautiful, um, kind, caring individual trying to find her way through this world. And of course, Loki from the Avengers and also from Norse mythology, a fully rounded character. He's a trickster, but he also has this strange honor to his family. Um, he's always messing up and tricking people and then they get in trouble, but then it comes back on him and he finds a way to make it right and repay. He's a, a very, very interesting character. And now uh, from a book, uh, I apologize, from a short story called Walking Out, we have here uh, the very first paragraph of, it, of this short story. Um, and I'll read it. It says, as the train rocked dead at Livingston, he saw the man in a worn khaki shirt with buttoned flaps buttoned, arms crossed. The boy's hand sprang up by reflex, and his face broke into a smile. The man smiled back gravely and nodded. He did not otherwise move. The boy turned from the window and, with the awesome deliberateness of a fat child harboring reluctance, began struggling to pull down his bag. His father would wait on the platform. First sight of him had reminded the boy that nothing was simple enough now for hurrying. So David Quammen goes on to build these incredibly rich characters. They're, they're actually the only two characters in the book, uh, the only two human characters. I keep saying book, I apologize, in the short story. And um, even just in this, we, we begin to feel connection. We know that the father is closed off. He's so closed off that he's wearing a khaki shirt, which is kind of blasé, and it has buttoned flaps. And not only does it have buttoned flaps and his arms are crossed, but he actually has buttoned the buttons. There, He's closed off. He's not to be breached. He's uh, guarded. And then this boy, um, this kind of fat, chubby boy um, on a train who's very excited to see his father. His arm shoots up in a reflex. His face breaks into a smile. He's so excited, but yet he's also very awkward in his body. He's struggling to pull down the bag. Um, and then we know that the father isn't exactly helpful. Maybe he's awkward himself. He waits on the platform instead of going to help. Um, and, and there's a beautiful line there at the end where the boy realizes that nothing now is going to be simple. He's entering into a very complex situation, uh, which I highly recommend you read the book Walking Out. It 
it, he, it is a very complex situation. Once again, short story. So characters can be flat, they can be round. And now how do they move through a story? Uh, we can say that, that characters are static. These are characters that do not change their point of view over the course of the story, or only minimally. They keep the same personality, their character traits from beginning to end, and some protagonists are static. Um, a character does not need to grow, actually. They usually do, but there are cases where from beginning to end, uh, the character is quite static. Often an antagonist will be static, but not always. So the opposite thereof would be a dynamic character. These dynamic characters undergo changes throughout the story. They have ups, they have downs, they have flaws, they have strengths, and somehow through the course of the story they grow, they develop, they learn something about the world situation, possibly change their worldview, their point of view on things, they grow, they change, they are, hence, dynamic. Place. I have here a short film uh, called Bounden. It's a Pixar short. And see if you can identify um, characters in this, the types of characters. Here's a story on how strange is life with its changes, and it happened not long ago. On a high mountain plain where the sagebrush arranges a playground south of the snow, lived a lamb with a coat of remarkable sheen. It would glint in the sunlight all sparkly and clean, such a source of great pride that it caused him to preen. And he'd break out in high step and dance. He would dance for his neighbors across the way. I must say that they found his dancing and handsome for that also joined in the play. <laughs> then one day, up the slope came a great American jackalope. This sage of the sage, this rare hair of hope, caused to pause and check out the lamb. Hey kid, why the mope? Well, I used to be something all covered with fluff and I'd dance in the sunlight and show off my stuff. Then they hauled me away in a manner quite rough and shared me and dumped me back here in the buff. In a fashion not enough, now my friends all laugh at me because they think I look ridiculous, funny, and pink. Pink? Pink? Well, what's wrong with pink? Seems you've got a pink ink in your thing. Does it matter what color? Well, that gets nope. Be it pink, purple, or heliotrope. Now, sometimes you're up and sometimes you're down. When you find that you're down, well, just look around. You still got a body, good legs and fine feet. Get your head in the right place and hey, you're complete. 
Now, as for the dancing, you can do more. You can reach great heights. In fact, you can soar. You just get a leg up and you slap it on down, and you'll find you're up in what's called the bound, bound, bound and rebound, bound, and you're up right next to the sky. And I think you can do it if you give it a try. First, get a leg up, slap it on down. about May, they'd load him up and they'd haul him away, and they'd shave him and dump him all naked and bare. He learned to live with it. He didn't care. He just bound, bound, bound and rebound. Now in this world of ups and downs, so nice to know there are jackalopes around. All right, so that was bounded. So Let's talk about who we saw in here. Protagonist. Right. The sheep. It's all about the sheep and how he gets shorn and how he goes from uh, dancing and then not feeling good about himself and then all those things. Uh, the antagonist. Who do you think? Ah, the ranchers. The ranchers get in the way of him getting his play done, so to speak. Uh, we've got a lot of round characters. Um, the, you know, it's a very short piece, but you could say that the jackalope has um, some character traits to him. He wanders. He, um, you know, he's pretty round for such a short piece, as is the sheep. Uh, but flat characters, clearly the, the little ground squirrels or whatever they are, uh, all they do is giggle. The, no matter what time of year, they're always in the same spot. The, sh the snake also and the owl, they just kind of dance along to the music. There's nothing really to them. Um, static characters. The jackalope. He comes in enlightened. He goes out enlightened. He comes in happy. He leaves happy. Same thing. Uh, but the dynamic characters are here. We've got the sheep. He goes from being content in the beginning but not understanding. And then... You know, the hero's quest begins. He he has his first gate. He gets sad. He gets shorn. He doesn't know what to do. He meets his sage, so to speak. He meets his jackalope, who teaches him the ways. He learns from the ways. The next time he gets shorn, he doesn't care anymore, and now he's happy. So he has grown and progressed. Um, and foils, don't really see a foil. You could say that in the beginning, um, the happiness of the ground squirrels giggling and all of that stuff is juxtaposed against the melancholy of the sheep, but it's a pretty weak foil. But Tom Sawyer. So if you have not, take a look and read the scene from Tom Sawyer where he is whitewashing the fence. Very popular place to be. So couple of questions and these questions come from the center of lit um, dot com which is teaching the classics um, a wonderful resource so what is the protagonist like make a list of a few adjectives first off who is the protagonist it's Tom Sawyer and uh, who is he he's a small boy um, he's around 12 um, but very immature and what do we know about him? He's sneaky. He's tricky. He's constantly trying to trick people into doing his work. He's lazy. Um, it's kind of the whole point of this. Um, 
of what nationality is the protagonist. He's American. This happens in uh, St. Petersburg, Missouri, on the banks of the Mississippi, and that's where Tom is from. He's a native in his own land. He's from there, and we are from there also, given that this class is taking place in the United States. So these are our people. We know these people. And more importantly, Tom knows these people. Tom grew up here. Tom lives with Aunt Polly here. Tom knows the names of the boys walking down the street. He knows every inch of this street, the ins and outs of the politics down by the pump. He's almost a king of his domain here. What does the character do for a living? Well, he's a boy. He does chores. Aunt Polly sends him to whitewash the fence. Is he wealthy? Well, in the beginning, no. He's not wealthy. He's got a couple of, you know, trinkets in his pocket, so to speak. But is he content with his lot in life? No. He wants to be wealthy. He's longing for freedom. He wants to no longer be forced to whitewash the fence. And does his priorities, do his priorities change over the course of the story? In what way? Does he remain unchanged while other characters change for the better or for the worse? So Tom ends up successfully tricking the boys, uh, beginning with Ben, the one that he was most worried about. There's also this kind of delightful scene where the, the boy Ben comes up the street after doing his own chores, pretending to be a steamboat and the captain and the shoreman and the everybody all at one time. This interesting thing that Mark Twain wrote about. Um, but he, Tom tricks him. And he begins gathering payment for allowing people to whitewash the fence. What a fun thing it is. Um, and he collects payments such as a dead rat with a string to swing it by, a cat with one eye, um, you know, some bits of broken blue glass, a doorknob, um, all sorts of these kinds of, of little trinkets, little boyish trinkets. Um, so he ends the story quite wealthy, but he's still... A trickster. He's still only fooling people. He's still lazy um, and he gains momentary freedom. But as soon as the job is done, the last bit that we read says he goes back to report to Aunt Polly. So he is still a captor. Um, he's still not free. So this has been a brief introduction, a review of the elements of fiction characters. I hope you'd enjoyed it. Um, have a great day.